Welcome to our first podcast. This is Keys to Understanding the Middle East, hosted by the Middle East Studies Center at The Ohio State University. And I have the director of the center here with us, um, Dr. Alam Payand, and I'm the assistant director of the center, Melinda McClymans. And we're gonna start off the podcast with one of the most important things to learn if you wanna understand the Middle East, which is diversity in Islam. And so what I plan on doing, we're just gonna wrap this up within a half hour. I'm just gonna give some, a few brief facts about Islam. And then I'm gonna um, basically let Dr. Payan take over and maybe ask him a few more questions um, if there's time. But um, I think you'll get some deep insights on the diversity of Islam today. And then um, we'll, in our next podcast, we can develop some of those facets a little bit more. So I'm looking forward to this. And um, hopefully soon we'll start doing this as a live stream as we kind of get the hang of it. So thanks for bearing with us as we learn the technology. All right, so I'm sharing a few um, statistics on my screen here. Um, I think it's always good to just, you know, get our brains going with some facts. Um, and, you know, basically, if, if you are talking about Islam today, it's one of the world's major religions. So, um, in fact, when you're talking about the Middle East, you're talking about a region that contributed um, three major religions to the world. Um, of course, many others that we you know, don't have time to get into today. But um, in terms of just numbers of adherence, numbers of the faithful for each religion, 55% uh, of the world's population profess one of the Abrahamic religions, which come from the Middle East. So we've got 2.3 billion Christians, 1.8 billion Muslims, and 0 0.01 billion Jews. And that's Pew Research, and it's, those numbers are from 2017. So that's the most up-to-date uh, research that I could find on the numbers. Um, and um, each of these three religions considers Jerusalem as a sacred city, and especially the Temple Mount and the, the Dome of the Rock, which I have a picture of here. Let me see if I can enlarge it. Probably there's a quicker way to do it, but I'm still learning, <laughs> learning all, all the tools. But there, there it is. And um, that, of course, is in Israel. Um, and uh, Jerusalem is both Palestinian and Israeli. Um, of course, that's a story for another day. Um, but. Uh, when, when we're talking about Islam, this, this was actually the first centerpiece of Islam or the, uh, the direction that people would pray to when Islam, in the very early days of Islam, when it first started. And then, and then the Qibla, the direction of prayer, was changed to Mecca. So um, just to kind of shift focus a little bit from Jerusalem, um, and actually, maybe I'll take it off of this and put our faces up for a second. So when you're talking about Islam and, you know, its origins, you're talking about Mecca. So you're talking about um, the Prophet Muhammad was a member of the Quraysh tribe that was located in Mecca. And he was born in 570 on the Arabian Peninsula there in Mecca. And Mecca was an important trade post. You know, uh, at the time you had the Persian Empire, the Sasanian Empire, and then you had the Eastern Roman Empire, also known as the Byzantine Empire. They were sort of like the superpowers of the time. And so there was a massive amount of trade back and forth. And even though it seems like an unlikely place because it was really in the middle of the desert, um, Mecca did become a major trade post. And another draw to Mecca, even then, even before Islam, 
was the Kaaba. The, um, it was also a pilgrimage site at that time. So people would go to the Kaaba, which was supposed to have been built by Abraham and which at the time Muhammad was born in 570 housed uh, pagan idols. And um, they would also hang poetry, like the, the most, um, you know, the, the award-winning poems would be hung there. Um, and it was a, a major location in terms of culture and trade and um, uh, religion even then. So very interesting uh, how it, it, it got its prominence. And, um, and so, you know, um, when um, Islam was born there, you know, it, it really spread like wildfire throughout the Middle East. And, and of course, I should just remind the audience that we're going to be focused on Islam in the Middle East. Of course, Islam is a global religion, though. I'm just going to show a, a map really quick here. So this is Islam worldwide. And you can see, you know, that, so the darker green is the more concentrated population uh, the centers of, of Islam. And it still is concentrated in the Middle East, but you can see it's worldwide. And the most populous Muslim country is uh, Indonesia, which is not even in the Middle East. So if you just note here on this map that Islam is um, a global religion, but we're, we are focused on the Middle East today. So Dr. Payan, do you think you could talk about diversity in Islam starting with the early days of Islam and then maybe um, connect that to today and what we see today in terms of diversity? Yes, as you mentioned that uh, Makkah used to be a trading post. Uh, after almost 500 years of wars between the Byzantine Empire and the Persians, uh, those rivalries finally what happened uh, some other trading posts developed in different parts of the world. Uh, Melinda, can you hear me now? Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you sound, you sound so very what clear. what happened? Uh, Jeddah, Mecca, Medina, these became the, 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 the trading posts uh, that the Jewish merchants, Christian merchants, even merchants from India at the time, before the birth of the Prophet Muhammad. So those merchandise, those commodities, through the caravans were passing through these cities. And so Makkah became one of the trading posts uh, that all sorts of people were coming there. And then from Makkah, it will go to all the way to Damascus. And even Prophet Muhammad in his, before he declared that he is the messenger of God, uh, as you mentioned that he was born in 570 AD in Makkah among one of the very powerful tribes. And his Prophet Muhammad's grandfather uh, by the name of Abdul Muttalib, he was the custodian of the, this pagan shrine of the Kaaba. Kaaba in Arabic, it means it's a cube-shaped uh, building that which had all kinds of idols uh, from the pagan period. So each tribe had their own god and goddesses and that sorts of thing in the Makkah. So it used to be a shrine and at the same time a trading post. And all sorts of people from all religions and even pagans were passing through that. So it, it was a very diverse uh, commercial posts. And Prophet Muhammad, uh, he married a rich woman by the name of Khadija. So he became her representative in business. And he would take these caravans from today's Jeddah and Mecca to Medina, from Medina, even to the gates of the Damascus. And he would not enter the city of Damascus because according to him, it was a very corrupt city, even at that time. So he was he became familiar with the Jewish tradi religious traditions and Christian religious traditions. There is one another religion that which we should mention that also a Middle Eastern religion, which is the Zoroastrianism. Yeah. It, it is about almost about eight, nine hundred years before, uh, before the birth of Jesus. Uh, we are talking about the 800, 900 BC. Zoroastrianism is also a monotheistic religion. And again, it was originated in today's Afghanistan and became the official language, I mean, the official religion of the Persian Empire. But it is a monotheistic, but not Abrahamic monotheistic. You are absolutely right that the monotheistic Abrahamic religions are Judaism, the oldest one, Christianity, the second oldest, and Islam, the youngest. So in other words, 
Islam is about almost 522 years, uh, 622 years younger than the Christianity. But one of the branches of the Abrahamic religions, Islam has taken a great deal uh, from, now uh, from the great deal from Christianity and Judaism. So when Prophet Muhammad became 40 years old, uh, he said that he re received divine revelation from God and he is one of the messengers of God. So that's what, when he was 40 years old. Then he was persecuted at the beginning by the people of the Makkah, his own relatives, this Quraysh tribe. So his relatives, especially his uncle, by the yeah. name of Abu, Abu Lahab, that's the Quran has those narration, those stories. So he was persecuted. Then finally, what happened? The people of Medina, which is about 200 miles north of Mecca, they invited Prophet Muhammad to become their leader. And that was in 622 AD. And he established in the first Islamic state in 622 AD. In 630 AD, the same people that who rejected him in Mecca, so Mecca was surrendered without any kind of battle at the time in 630 AD. Then he passed away in 632 AD. He died. Prophet Muhammad died after a short illness. When he died in his lifetime, Prophet Muhammad was for Muslims. He was both the messenger of God, both prophet and messenger, because there is a difference between the prophets and the messengers, because he brought the message, which is Quran is his message. Like Torah is the message of, the, of, of, of Moses. Are for Muslims, for example, Psalms are the message of David. Uh, so the Quran is this revelation. He said that I'm the messenger of God. So it started at the beginning. He was persecuted. Then this Islamic state was established in his lifetime. Almost Arabia became Islamized. He died in 632 AD. Quickly, two years after, uh, four years after his death, this new Islamic state, which was mostly built by the Quraysh at that time, the same tribe of the Prophet Muhammad. They defeated the Byzantine Empire in 636 AD. Then one year later, and in 637 AD, they defeated the Persian Empire. So when they defeated the, 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 the Byzantine Empire, they captured Syria and Jerusalem in those areas uh, from the Byzantine Empire. Then they captured Iraq from the Sasanians at the time. So quickly, Islam spread to other parts of the world. So from the beginning, Islam was not only originated among the Quraysh, and then it included people from the African race uh, and the, China, the, the, the from people from East Asia, which were the Chinese and others who were Islamized people of different parts of the world. And then Islam spread to today's Turkey and from Turkey to Iran, from Iran to Central Asia, Uzbek, Turkmen's, Tajiks, they became Muslims. And, and then it went to Afghanistan, Afghan, Afghanistan became Islamized. Iran was already Islamized at that time. So from the beginning, Islam became a group of very diverse people. All kinds of races were there. Uh, so, in a, But at the beginning, before the Prophet Muhammad, Arabs were a group of racist Quraysh. They were looking down upon all other people that were non-Arabs. They even had the word for them, Ajam. Ajam means that people who are dumb, they can, so that was uh, people that who could not even speak Arabic. So Arabic was considered to be a language of the literature at that time. As I mentioned that this shrine of Kaaba, the, the, the pagan shrine before the birth of Muhammad, they would have one year, each year they will have this Hajj. The same tradition that the Muslims still follow is the fifth pillar of Islam. It used to be a pre-Islamic tradition that in the period of the time, the pilgrimage, they would stop fighting with each other, killing each other. And then that was a time that they would have festivals and, and at the same time. Uh, those great poets will present their poetry and then there were prizes for given. That's what the, you use the term muallaqat, that they would hang those poems that which get the prize at the time and become first, second, third and fourth. So, so in a way, this literature was flourishing at the time because it was a trading post. Uh, it, then Prophet Muhammad died after a short sickness in 632 AD. Here is now the division comes just like in Christians experienced the schism in about 1050 or 1053 AD, uh, which the Catholics separated from the Eastern Orthodox churches. Uh, that was the schism that which happened among the, the, the Christian uh, community of the time. Uh, then in among Islam, it happened right after the death of the Prophet Muhammad. One group of the Muslims, the companions of the Prophet Muhammad said that 
let's give the leadership to the to the children of the Prophet Muhammad through his daughter and his son-in-law. He did not have male children. So they became the Shiites that who wanted to support his son-in-law who was from the his kin. They were following this kinship. And the other group who became the Sunnis, they said that, well, let's go to the Quran. What is in the Quran? Guidance for the Muslims. In Quran, there are many passages that Muslims should decide their problems and affairs by the consensus. So let's have a consensus. So this, the Sunnis started the process of consensus that let's select someone. They became the Sunnis. And the one who said that, well, look, it has to be in the family of the Prophet Muhammad because it is blessed by God. They're innocent. So that would so they became the Shiites. Until this date, the Shiites have established the institution of Imama, like Imam Khomeini and others, and as they're the, the Shiites, they, they follow. Ali was the first Imam of the Shiites. He was the son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad, and at the same time, his cousin. So that is the Imamat institution, which was Shiites until follow until this date. In the other group, they went after Khilafah. Then the institution of Khilafah, which was a selected group by the community of the Muslims. And after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, the first person who was chosen for that by the Arab, by the community of this first Muslim state, uh, was Abu Bakr, one of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad. Then he died after two years. Then they selected someone else by the name of uh, Omar. He was assassinated. Then they selected the third one, are elected or selected. This, not, this was not kind of like the ballot kind of, it was mostly male coming to a consensus. That was the sort of selection process. The second one was Omar, he was assassinated. The third caliph was Usman, he was assassinated. Then the fourth one was Ali, which the Shiites, for the Shiites is the first Imam. He became the caliph for the Sunnis and became the first Imam for the Shiites. Then after the death of the Ali, uh, then the schism went, they fought with each other, different groups. Uh, Melinda, am I still, can you hear me now? Okay, I'm back. Sorry. Okay, you're back. What I happened? Think, I think my internet went down. I, I apologize. Okay. Yeah. All right. So again, so this this division at the beginning came as a Shia and the Sunni. This was the schism. There was a third group also appeared there. They were called Khawarij. They did not like the. They did not go with the Sunnis. They did not go with the Shiites. They created a different group and they yeah. became a violent group. Some people think that still there are some groups until they might not say declare themselves, but they are not with the Shiites or they are not with the Sunnis. So that was at the beginning, this Khawarij. Then with the passage Khawarij of... Khawarij means succeeders, right? People yeah, they, who yes. like sort of secede or... They, they went out. That's went out, the, yeah. That's, that's out. more plain English yes. translation. Yeah. Yeah. They, they went out of these both groups. Like they, they exited neither from with the Shiites, neither with the Sunnis. They yeah. totally created a third group. So anyhow, by the passage of the time, then the Sunnis, which were very unified for a short period of time, then there came, when came to the interpretation when the Prophet Muhammad died, because the sources of law in Islam is Quran is the first source of law. Then the second source of law, they call it Sunnah, are the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad. Yeah. The traditions of the Prophet Muhammad has two components. One is that what he said something, he uttered a word about such and such. That becomes the source of law. And then other portion of that is then we did something but did not say anything about that. So that's the tertiary secondary source. The tertiary source of law in Islam is when the, when the God is silent on something and Prophet Muhammad is silent, did not say it's a new thing, new development, then it has to be the jurist scholars of Islam, the people that who know about the Quran and about the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, they should say about some new things which develops new problems. And if they are silent, there is no thing, then an independent judge somewhere can use sort of 
deduction, uh, analogy by deduction somehow, they call it qiyas. So these are the sources of law for Muslim. When, when it came to the interpretation of these sources of law, then the Sunnis divided into four major schools until this date today. This is what the divisions come. And the Shiites okay. also so, divided into three major other Shiite groups. So then this spread. And from that now, there are subgroups of each one of them. And that's what the diversity we talk about Islam. So they became extremely I'm, diverse. I'm just going to um, pull up this list of the sources of law so that people can see um, on their screens. Um, you've got the Quran, number one. You've got the traditions of the prophet or the sunnah, number two. His words are hadith. His actions or the entirety of his traditions is the sunnah or the traditions. Yes. And sunnah also means path. So it means the right way, like following the path of, of the, the, the right path. And then consensus of the, and it's not just consensus of Muslims, but of actual experts and scholars of Islam, and that's ijma. And then four is analogy by deduction or qiyas. And then number five, which is kind of the most dynamic one, is the process of setting new precedents based on all four of those, which is called ijtihad. Absolutely. So, and this is directly from our book, by the way, Keys to Understanding the Middle East. And it's a free ebook. And if you want to um, get a quick, you know, um, quick read, you know, sort of the Middle East for dummies. <laughs> <laughs> Although it's definitely not for dummies, but um, it's a great way to just uh, quickly learn the key things you need to learn about the Middle East. Uh, uh, Middle East for the beginners. Uh, for beginners, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a much better way to put it. <laughs> so this created diversity that, um, that, that you know, uh, of course, there are different interpretations. And when you're talking about Sharia law, you're talking about not a book, but a library of laws, just like a law library you'd find today. So of course there's gonna be many different um, ways of executing the law or you know, um, uh, establishing laws in different countries and civilizations over time. So this clearly explains a lot of the diversity do you think you could talk to us a little bit about like modern day examples of diversity in Islamic law? Yes. Um, when it comes to interpretation, it's just like you see more Christian denominations. Many of them divided based on the interpretation of the text. Quran is a very small, relatively speaking, it's about, uh, it's almost as big as the, the Bible is. But everything is not in the Quran. Yeah. Quran was revealed 1400 years ago. It's about 114 chapters divided into 330 segments. Uh, it does not have anything about the blood transfusion. It does not have anything about right. the crack cocaine. It does not have anything about the supersonic jets. It does not have anything about how to deal with something like COVID-19. Well, um, there are. Maybe, plagues yeah. Are coming. yeah, so they have dealt with plagues and others. And then the scholars have come that when the plague comes, what should we do? How can we use now, make new laws about the new development? That's what exactly this, this legal, this Islamic jurisprudence, if you use all these five sources that you give, Quran and the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad and the consensus of the jurist scholars, uh, and then using the human knowledge, uh, mm -hmm. which is chaos, uh, uh, when, when new developments, new situation comes. And then when totally a new thing comes, let's take blood transfusion and heart transplantation and things like that. Right. Neither Christian, Christian textbooks, scriptures say anything about the heart transplantation, neither the Jewish uh, textbooks say anything, I mean, scriptures, never Islam. So, but the judges have to come up with some law. Then what they do? They use this, all these five. Uh, let me give you a very clear example. Let's take at the time of the horses and buggies. Uh, when the first, if let's say I'm a rider on a horse, 
and my two first feet of my horse injured someone. I, as a rider, am the responsible person. I have to pay reparation if somebody is hurt by my horse because I ran my horse, horse into them. But if someone comes behind my, my mule or horse or donkey and they, they kick them and so it's, it's the person is responsible. Just like today in the car, if you rear end my car, I'm not responsible because you hit me from the back. So in a way, what's this? this is all new situations. And I usually use the example of the crack cocaine. Crack cocaine is a substance which developed just a few years ago. Quran does not say anything about this. God is silent about that. Prophet Muhammad did not say anything. Ijma, there is nothing. There is no, so as a judge, I have to come up with something. Then what I do, I use human knowledge. I go back to the Quran and find a similar thing. In Quran, for example, it is liquor uh, is, is haram. It is not permissible to use because liquor takes you to a state of normalcy to abnormalcy. So if the crack cocaine is doing the same thing, that's what you derive new laws, new um, decrees based on the first important five sources. And if you use all these sources, any law, whether it's an Islamic law or Christian or Jewish, which is based on the, on the religious text, can become very dynamic. But the problem is, unfortunately, sometimes when it comes to interpretation, some people will only use Quran as a source of law in the saying and doing of the Prophet Muhammad. Then they would disregard the Qiyas, which is the analogy, the human knowledge, the human intervention, and things like that are the human using the, 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 the two sacred sources with other uh, man-made sources. So, so for that reason, some societies have remained very rigid. Uh, let's take for group in Afghanistan, uh, when you look at either Taliban or Al-Qaeda, uh, they disregard the Ijtihad portion, they disregard the, the, the Qiyas portion, they just took what, what they they're literalist in some ways, and that's why they are in some cases they are called either puritanical or literalists in that sense. Is it that like uh, those those groups that just look at the Quran? Is is it just that they don't have like a tradition of jurisprudence? Like they don't have fiqh? Or they they are against it, or um, how did that happen? Why why don't well, they? That's a good question. Uh, when Prophet Muhammad was dying, uh, he mentioned um, that just like the Christians before them are the Jews divided into so many different groups, debating each other, especially when you come to the, the schism and things like that. So. They were aware of that, that Islam will also divide mm -hmm. into different groups. So right. until Prophet Muhammad was alive, that was one community of, they call it Ummah, of the Muslims. And after that, they divided into different groups. But somehow, from the beginning, uh, Islam had some, uh, in, in its origin, uh, when you look at Quran, there are verses in the Quran which God is saying, for example, that I have created human beings from a pair of male and female and divided them into different tribes and different groups to recognize each other. The best of the human beings in the sight of God are the ones that were pious. God knows about everything. So that's what here, that, that oh, you human beings, I have created from a male and female. Uh, and that's that that's, says that it's, it's all human beings are the creation of the God. And there are another verse in the this one that which I mentioned. That's in Surah 49, and Ayah are the verse 13. And there is another one uh, in uh, in the Quran, which is uh, somehow the chapter 95, verse 1 to 8. That mentions that God had created the human beings. It's a go back to the story of the Genesis that God had created human being in the best mold. Uh, it's just human beings. Uh, it does not say that black and white. And also there are the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, many. 
that there is no difference between a white and black. Only the difference is that, I mean, the, 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 in the sight of God, someone who is a pious, so piety is important thing. No difference between black and white. No difference between Arab and Ajam, uh, Arab or non-Arab. So there are those things that which is against racism, against re, uh, discrimination. But somehow, how many Muslims are following Islam the way it is in, in, in the text, in the books? And how many Christians are following what is in, in the Christian uh, scriptures? So the Muslims are today uh, divided in different ways. And then add to all of this, is Islam captured the whole of North Africa, Spain, Portugal, and then, yeah. uh, then they went to Afghanistan and Turkey and Central Asia, and all those areas came under the control of the Muslims. All kinds of people came. But then Islam went to the subcontinent of India. So what happened when Islam went to those regions, those pre-Islamic tradition of Hinduism is very much mixed with the Muslims are in India when they are practicing their Islam. When it went to Turkey and other places, then Sufism got mixed, a sort of mysticism, Islamic right. mysticism, yeah, and the Jewish mysticism and the Christian mysticism. So a group of mystics came. And when you throw all of this together, so today Islam is a very diverse Muslims themselves, whether it's 1.2 billion in the world, uh, they are divided into, but there is one thing, the Quran, which for Muslims is the word of God from one end to another, there is no difference between a Shia Quran or a Sunni Quran or an Alawi Quran or this or what the other branches have come. Quran is the same. And again, when, when you interpret the verses of the Quran, mm -hmm. the chapters of the Quran, in interpretation, there are different interpretations. And that's what, when it comes to the details, these new groups, still groups are being formed, new groups. Uh, so it, that, that's where the, the, the division comes. Uh, it came to the Christianity also in, in, in terms of interpretation. And Islam is dealing with that. The Taliban in Afghanistan are interpreting Quran and the traditions of the Muhammad. They will take the very strict the, the portions of the Quran and apply it. And from some other, when you go to the Afghan uh, or Muslim mystics, they would use the love of God as a source of, of dealing with other human beings. So for them, the, this, they are using the inner sort of cleansiness of the personal of, of the individuals. Um, so it's the inner, that's the inner side of the, of the religion and the outer side of the religion. So the division comes when different groups and different, and then again, the, the Greek philosophy was translated by the Arabs. Aristotle's logic was translated by the Arabs. Yeah. And finally, they have used and utilized most of those knowledge which were the, for the ancient Greeks and others, and the Persian too, um, calendars and others which have come the, from the Persian Empire. So Islam has absorbed, Muslims have absorbed whatever knowledge was available to them, whether those were the Chinese agricultural traditions or the irrigation systems or the papers or the sciences or the knowledge and astronomy or logic or whatever, medicine. So they have taken advantage of all the existing knowledges of the humanity before Islam and after Islam, after the, the death of the Prophet Muhammad. So the diversity, uh, when we look at that, if, if you really look only at the verses of the Quran and the traditions of the, there is tremendous amount uh, which is emphasizing uh, very clearly uh, that respect for human beings. Uh, and again, in, in, when you look at this, especially the, the mystical poetry is full of that, that uh, human beings are organs and limbs of each other. That's Saadi, which is written in the United Nations. Bani Adam Azai Yagdi Garand. Okay, that's a, a Persian. I go back to Persian very quickly. That human beings are organs and limbs in a body of, in a full body of humanity. When one limb is in pain, uh, it does not let the whole body to rest. So, uh, and if you do not, if you are not concerned with the pain of other human being, you do not deserve to be called a human being. So it, it, it's, it's a tremendous amount of, and again, these poets were not only poets, they were scholars of Islam and scholars of Quran and the Hadith and other. 
And again, Maulana Jalaluddin Rumi, which is known for the pagans and Christians and Jews, they all respect him because yeah. his poetry is very much based on the humanity uh, and, 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 and universal humanism, so to speak. Uh, there are those strains uh, in Islam. So the respect for diversity among human beings. Uh, and again, when you go to Hajj, which is the fifth pillars of Islam, uh, in, in, when, you, when they do this rituals of the Hajj, you will see a blonde, a blonde guy with the blue eyes, with the Chinese, with an African looking people, and all kinds of Turkmens, Uzbeks, Tajiks, and this and that, that tells you that they're all wearing some similar kind of garments, only a white piece of shroud kind of thing. So the, the, this is all uh, that, that symbolically, uh, that human beings are all uh, members, of the, the creation of the God, and if God want, again, there are verses of the Quran. If the God had wanted to create only one kind of people, he would have done that. And that's why he has created all kinds of people, black, white, yellow, uh, and, and, and whatever. And so it, it, there is nothing in, in the religion that you can take from it that, um, uh, well, racism is a, is a good quality. Uh, discrimination against other human beings is a good quality. Or killing is a good, oh, the Ten Commandments is another one. Uh, which is not only uh, important for the, the Old Testament and the New Testament, especially the Ten Commandments. Muslims believe in every single one of them uh, after ten. Uh, so, uh, the, but but we do not know much. Islam is one of the most misunderstood religions, uh, and again, uh, some of this is fault of the Muslims themselves, uh, because there are wars going on in each country: the Shia, the Sunni, the this and that, and. Pakistan against uh, Iran, uh, Afghanistan, Afghanistan against Pakistan, and that sort of thing. Iran, Iraq war. So they fought each other. I think that people look at uh, Sharia law, first of all, and they think it's, you know, very uh, restrictive and they focus on that. And probably the media does too, but they don't know um, all the philosophies you know, over the years that have shaped Islam as well, you know, very tolerant philosophies and also intolerant ones. And in fact, before we wrap up, um, I thought it might be interesting to, yeah, I mean, emphasize that Islam is mainly an inclusive religion with much more kind of, it's, it's actually amazingly unified, like you're describing like it's the same Quran, no matter almost no matter what, um, because it was written down so quickly after it was revealed. It, you know, even though this wasn't a time with a printing press and most people didn't know how to read and write, they they wrote it down really quickly. So that is pretty amazing, like how how you know standard that main text is and how unified a lot of the practices are and how inclusive the religion is in terms of like. Yeah, there are differences, there are different religions, but you should respect, respect all the groups of human beings and not discriminate, um, you know, according to um, color or creed or uh, even gender. I mean, even the Quran is a more inclusive language, you know, speaking to the believers, both men and women, like by... Meaning, oh, believers, oh, male believers, oh, female believers. But, um, but in terms of like, um, the, the topic for today, like, is, and we do have to wrap up now, but, um, is there one key thing, um, that kind of emphasizes how diverse? Psalm can be depending on which neighborhood you're in or which country you're in? Yes, uh, uh, it depends on, as I mentioned, that religions adapt to the geographical and the tradition of society. When, when, when in Islam went from the Middle East, Christianity is the same. When Christianity originated in the Middle East, but it went to other parts of the world. If you go today and talk to an Orthodox Nestorian or 
Yeah. Sarah Aiken, others and others, they will tell you that what is happening in the United States in evangelical Christian, they're not with good Christians and that sorts of thing, because mm -hmm. it has, it, it's, it's different from where it originated. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so the same is true uh, in Islam. But again, coming to this, uh, you mentioned that Islam, Quran has mentioned that mu'minin wal mu'minat, or believing men and all believing women. Mm -hmm. But it's more mentioned, ya ayyuhan nas, in Quran, hundreds of times, oh, you human beings. Yeah. So it's addressing the humanity and the human the, beings. The I have created humanity. you from a pair of men and female to divided you into different tribes and this and that. And about the languages too. If God wanted to people to speak in one language, they would, he would have, but he created this diversity. This is the beauty in, in the, and again, another thing that which we have to mention that many of the Muslims do not know that either, the ones who are not educated. Mm -hmm. that in Islam there are 99 named attributes of God. Most of them are God is the merciful, the most merciful, the most kind, the most eternal, the most forgiving. When you repent, God accepts your repentance, just like he accepted the repentance of Adam, for example. That's the, the first sin and that sort of thing. God accepted the repentance of David. David was not only a king for Muslims, he was a, a messenger of God too. Uh, so for, for Muslim, both Solomon and, and, and so it, in some cases, kings and prophets and these are divided. But in many cases, and Prophet Muhammad is not the only messenger of God. He is in one of the chain of these prophets which started from Adam and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and uh, Jacob and Joseph. These are all messengers of God. Moses is a messenger of God. After that, Jesus is a messenger of God, and Prophet Muhammad is a messenger. Of, he's, he's not the only messenger. Uh, somehow, and again, when we come to that, that we can, Allah. Allah is the name of the same God. It's Yahweh, uh, which Abraham came up with. Uh, Abraham was, according to Muslims, Abraham is the founder of the monotheism, just like the Jews and the Christians would say that. Mm -hmm. uh, his father was an idol maker, uh, and then he was the one that who came up with the, the, that there is only one God. Uh, and later this was confirmed by the Ten Commandments and others and others. So in Islam, if a Muslim is not a, a, a Muslim, if he does not submit to both the Christianity, the, the Christian books, are, that's why they call it the people of the book. The people of the books are Muslims, Christians, Jews and Sabians and others. Uh, so they, they, these are the things that unfortunately many Muslims do not know, especially the uneducated one or the wrongly educated one. But the ones who are educated, for them it is, it is the, the, the common humanity is a very important uh, pillar of, 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 of Islam that to treat other human beings just like you treat yourself and your family members. These, these are very common if you read the, 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 the parts of the Quran and you do not, you may think that it is translation. There are story of the, of, of the, of the Genesis, the creation of Adam. There is a story of the great flood in Quran. Uh, there is a story of the Moses in Quran, the Exodus in Quran. And the birth of the Virgin Mary is in the Quran. There is one full chapter in Quran about that Surat al-Maryam, about mm -hmm. the Mary. Uh, and there is a full chapter about Joseph, uh, the son of Jacob, that which was thrown in the well by his half brothers. So that's uh, so all sorts of uh, Moses has been mentioned in the Quran. I do not know how many, literally, tens of times uh, uh, than the Prophet Muhammad. And Abraham has been mentioned so yeah. many times. So in, in some ways, that's what when we talk about that Islam is not. It's misunderstood by many people, um, not only in the United States, and I would say in, in Muslim societies themselves. Many Muslims do not know about uh, about the uh, about Islam uh, and the tenets of Islam and the laws in Islam. Yeah, there's definitely much more that unifies Islam than than separates it. Um, especially, I think. Uh, I mean, I think from the outside, you know, um, if 
from the outside looking in, um, it can seem like, well, especially if you look at the map, there's like, you know, there's Shiism here, there's Sunni Islam there. Um, you can even look at the different uh, schools of thought and, and the different uh, ways that countries implement Sharia law. And there's a lot of diversity, but um, in terms of like core beliefs, there's a lot that unifies and unites Islam across the world. Right now, there is a war going on in Yemen. And it's the Hutsi, it's a group of, there are about 40% of the Yemenis are Shia. Mm -hmm. They are not the same Shia as the Iranians are. Okay. Iranians are the 12 are Shiites. They go mm -hmm. after all the 12 Imam and the 12th Imam disappeared in the, uh, so that's what they're waiting for that to come as a Messiah. Uh, the 12th Imam. So these Husis are the ones that which separated from the other group of Shiites. They went after the 5th Imam, the 5th descendant of the Prophet Muhammad through his daughter and his son-in-law. There's the Yadis. The Yadis are there. there. But mm -hmm. since Iran is a Shia, they're supporting this the Yadi Shiites Husis. And on the other hand, the other 60% majority are the Sunnis in Yemen. They're supported by Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, this and that. There is a war going on between the Shia and the Sunni in Yemen, and Iran is taking the sides of the Shiites, and these Bahrain and Qatar, they're taking the side of it. And this is one reason why these two countries of Bahrain and United Arab Emirates are now recognizing Israel legitimacy because of the fear of the Iran. So again, I, I was mentioning that. Yeah. The yeah. succession of the Prophet Muhammad from the beginning, it was not based on theological arguments. It okay. was based on political It was to right. be right. an important distinction. Distinction that who should be his successor. Mm -hmm. It's a political, who should be the leader of the Muslim community. Uh, the same, the, this sort of thing, the Iran-Iraq war, eight years, this Shia Iran Ayatollahs fought against the Sunni-controlled Iraq, which has the Shia majority, for eight years they slaughtered each other and killed literally millions. But yeah. one horrible. Iran, horrible. It's a horrible war. It was the most expensive war until, in many ways, uh, the eight year war between Iran and Iraq. So these are the problems that the Muslims have to deal with that. And they grew in numbers. In some cases, they are in a very rich part of the, uh, the oil countries, and then the oils have attracted the attention of the superpowers in different times. Right. And so so it, it, there are a lot of things which going on. A part of that, most, I would say that major part of that is the one can blame the leaders uh, and the corrupt leaders in the Muslim society. None of the Muslim societies have a good democracy. They do not have freedom of press, freedom of association. Many of them are run either by the totalitarian military leaders Many of them are ruled by a dynastic corrupt monarchies. Yeah. So there are a few countries that they really elect their, their presidents and their parliaments uh, in a free election. Turkey used to be very close to that. That's now going the, the wrong way. Um, so, so in a way, uh, things have become so mixed that even Muslims are confused. Uh, many of the young people that whether it's a, it's the mistake of the religion, uh, or it is really the mistake of the, the corrupt leadership in, in, in Muslim societies. Uh, well, this is not something new. Even in the United States, we are now, we do not know whether this, we are fighting against this COVID-19. Whether it's the, the government did not do a good job, or no one can do something about it. So these disputes are something, but somehow advanced and progressive societies like uh, educated societies, they solve their problems by some sort of consensus and election. If you do not like a president, you do not elect him again. And after eight years, you go for someone else. Absolutely. But the, the, the people in the Muslim societies do not have the same, the, the same luxury as many of the Western European countries do. Or the United yeah. Countries. yeah, we take it for granted still here, I think. Yeah. But we, we shouldn't. 
Well, um, it's 623. We've been talking for 50 minutes. Um, I think we should wrap up, uh, but is there any anything else you want to share? No, I think that we covered the most uh, related things that are relevant things. Probably uh, we will take pick up another topic in the future. Yeah, there's there's a lot of different directions to go um, because diversity is never ending. But um, I think that that gives a good starting point if people are wanting to really understand, you know. Um, Islam, you know, not as a monolith, but as a kind of very human, diverse, evolving kind of uh, religion. So, yeah, and again, it's, it's not only the Sunnis are not monolith; the Shiites are not either. We did not even right. talk right. about other subgroups, so that they're, they're very different from each other in many ways. Yeah, I mean, I think if it, I mean, I've been to, I lived in Saudi Arabia, I've spent time in Turkey and in Egypt, and all three, I mean, they're very different. They're extremely different from each other. Of course, there's a lot they share in terms of Islamic values, but otherwise, they're almost completely different from each other. And I mean, Egypt has a really large Christian population still. That's not, uh, that, especially the Coptic Christians, yeah. The, yeah, the, they're considered yeah. by some statistics that almost ten percent, eleven percent of the Egyptian oh, population. Least, I, I think it's um, probably even higher than that. Yeah. So yeah, if um, you can, if you can add all other Christians, because there are some some, some Catholics and Protestants too, uh, in addition to. Well, the, I mean, I think I think the Orthodox. the tendency with minorities is they're undercounted. So I think the official number is ten percent. So it's my guess is it's probably more, but that's just the way I, I think about it. But yeah, I think the official. I think if you go to the official numbers, it's, 10, it's about 10%. So yeah, so very interesting topic. And uh, certainly we'll, um, we'll, you know, riff off of what we did today. We'll choose, you know, some aspect to go into a little bit deeper in the next episode. Um, if we, if we like this recording, I can post it online and see what feedback we get. And maybe we'll get requests for topics and things like that. So what I'll do is I'm going to end the broadcast. I'm going to end the recording now. And, um, and then I'll be able to download it and play it so we can review it later and see what we think. Okay. Very good. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much, good. Dr. Payan, for your time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you on Tuesday then. See you on Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, good.